Thomas Harder, who holds the R. M. Hagen Endowed Chair for Water Management and Policy at the University of California at Davis. His okay, research cool. focuses on non-point the down or the right of down. And how do I do the mouse? Just here, the touchpad. On groundwater mo modeling and on contaminant transport. And his talk today is entitled "Understanding Groundwater Impacts from Dairies." Well, good morning, everybody. Um, Dan and um, uh, Shabit really sort of, sort of greased the skits here for my talk. Um, and again, I apologize, like Dan, I, I'd, I'd, I do like to stand up and be a little bit more lively. I'll try, I'll try my best sitting down here at this computer. Um, first, I want to actually thank a whole bunch of collaborators, and I'm going to not go through the list, but I just want you to understand all the pieces that I'm, uh, various pieces that I'm actually talking about today, and many of the data come from a very uh, diverse and large research group uh, that I've had the opportunity to work with over the past uh, 15 years on issues related to dairies. I'm going to start with this slide. Um, I'm, I'm a scientist, and um, I, for six years now, I'm holding this endowed chair for management and policy. And when I first looked at it, I said, I'm not, neither, I'm, I'm not into management, I'm not into policy. I'm, I'm really just into the science issues. But with the science and, and the science knowledge comes that we get involved into manage, in management and policy. And the, the way I look now at dairies or at groundwater nitrate or at any other environmental issue is is within this framework that I'm showing you here. When we look at environmental issues and when we, want to tr when we try to understand and wrap our hands, arms around an environmental issue, it really helps to dissect it and understand four or five topics around this issue. One is the science, and that's why we're here today, is understand the science of the issue. One is to understand what the law says and what the legislature intended to do. But <clears throat> that is a very different animal from what the regulatory agents, agencies may be doing and what the constraints of the regulatory agencies are. And then the, the, the last piece are the stakeholders. And the stakeholders include both the regulated community and the affected community. Um, and so let me start my talk by looking at this issue of dairies and groundwater quality sort of from a broader perspective and then get into uh, more of the details. Um, th if, if you just sort of to rehash the takeaway messages from some of what Dan and Shabe were saying, um, you've heard that manure is a, let's call it slow release fertilizer. Uh, not, not a precise fertilizer, it, it releases its nutrients over time, and that doesn't always match with the rapid dynamics of corn uptake or grain uptake, matches perhaps better with the uh, more, a more uh, ongoing uptake in, in pastures. Um, you've heard uh, from Chabé that we should be thinking of our fields as a leaky pipe. Things go in, things come out, but then in the process, the field leaks, and it leaks into the atmosphere, it leaks into surface water, it leaks into groundwater. And um, I, I, I like that model, and I'm going to work a lot with this model. Um, <clears throat> but what is this all about? Dan, Dan uh, alluded to it initially. From a groundwater perspective, and I'm a primarily groundwater hydrologist, and I'll bring you that perspective and then try to link to the more agronomist or soil science perspectives that we've heard earlier today. From a groundwater perspective, this is a nitrate is primarily a drinking water issue. Um, for drinking water, we have a maximum, contamination, a maximum contamination level of 10 milligrams per liter of nitrate as nitrogen, which is exactly the same as 45 milligrams per liter of, of nitrate. The 10 refers to just the N in the nitrate molecule. The nitrate, mo 45 milligrams of nitrate contain 10 milligrams of nitrogen. And so um, I just wanted to point that out. The drinking water limit is 45 milligrams of nitrate per liter, which is exactly the same as 10 milligrams of nitrate nitrogen per liter. So that's, that's, our, that's sort of from a groundwater perspective, that's our, 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 our red, red line. We, we'd like to have or be in a place where groundwater does not exceed that 10 milligrams of nitrate nitrogen per liter. 
This is a map uh, that was uh, produced by the USGS a few years back from ground data and statistical modeling, an estimation of the, nitrogen, uh, the nitrate nitrogen levels in uh, production level groundwater across the United States. And you can see that um, we have lots of nitrate in groundwater in the agricultural areas on the east shore. We have the Midwest with lots of nitrate, and especially the um, high plains um, and, and the Ogallala Aquifer. And then in the west, we have the Central Valley in the Southern California coastal valleys, highly affected with nitrate. Uh, we have the Snake River Valley in southern Idaho, and we have these regions that you're all familiar with in Washington and northern, um, northern Oregon, where we see these really high levels of nitrate that exceed, in many places, drinking water standards. All those areas that are red exceed drinking water standards. That's the driving issue. In, southern Cal in, in, the, in, in central California, um, this is a map of this area here in Central California. We've done some surveying of nitrate in groundwater as part of a study that was published two years ago. And you can see there's many areas in, in the southern part of the Central Valley uh, here and in the Salinas Valley where the average nitrate that we find uh, in wells um, exceeds, exceeds uh, frequently exceeds the drinking water limits. Um, this is a map of domestic wells and public water systems in that same region. Um, and you can see that there are thousands of domestic wells affected by uh, high levels of nitrate um, and a large number of uh, public water supply systems in that region. Many of these public water supply systems and many of these domestic wells are in economically disadvantaged communities that have issues with their infrastructure, they have a relatively low income level, um, and they often cannot afford to treat their water. The fact that drinking water, this nitrate issue, is primarily or often affecting economically disadvantaged communities um, is another driving factor behind um, regulatory efforts to deal with the nitrate issue. In some areas, we see domestic wells, typically we see domestic wells contaminated at levels on the order of about 10%. But there are areas in the eastern part of the San Joaquin Valley, um, um, like Tulare County, where between 30 and 40% of all domestic wells regularly exceed the drinking water limit for nitrate. The cost of treating for that nitrate level for this particular region um, uh, we estimate it to be on the order of 20 to $36 million per year. And if we extrapolate that to all of California, we're probably somewhere between 50 and $100 million per year just to treat for nitrate. What are the sources of that nitrate? It's not just the dairies that we're talking about today. There's many, many sources of nitrate. This is a, a map that shows both the Wastewater treatment plants in green that we have in this, in this particular region. Wastewater treatment plant plants produce effluent in liquid form, which they either recharge directly or they land apply to uh, crop fields. And they produce biosolids, which are also applied to uh, uh, crop fields. The same goes for food processors in the Central Valley and in the Salinas Valley, we have lots of food processors. They produce um, waste, mostly organic waste, that they also land apply either in solid form or liquid form or both. We have septic systems. You have septic systems. And we have lots of septic systems, typically in the peri-urban areas, in, in the areas around our cities that are sort of developing into a city but aren't hooked up to a central wastewater system yet. Uh, we have high density of those septic systems and they can surely cause significant amounts of groundwater pollution in those local areas. And then we have agriculture. And in California, we have a very diverse agriculture we grow, and we're proud to say we grow over 300 different crops. Each, crops, each crop has its own nutrient management practices, its own nutrient needs, um, and um, its own culture. When we look at that particular region, the southern part of the Central Valley and the Salinas Valley combined, which is about 40% of irrigated agriculture in California, and we look at all of the, nit the nitrate sources in groundwater, 95, over 95% of it comes from cropland. Um, and if you look at the cropland, we can break it apart into this 
leaky pipeline um, that we saw earlier. And what you see on the left side is what goes into the pipeline. That's the left half of the circle. And on the right half of the circle, the green part is what, you, what comes out of the pipeline that Shabay sh showed earlier. And the blue parts and green parts on the right-hand side, those are all the leaks. Um, <clears throat> we're looking at a nitrogen cycle for that part of California. And for total California, you want to just double those numbers, roughly. We're looking at 420,000 tons of nitrogen going into the agricultural landscape, about half of which comes from synthetic fertilizer. The most important part here is over one-third is from the dairy herd in the Central Valley. Over one-third of the nitrogen input to, the, to, to this agricultural landscape comes from the dairy herd. On the output side, only about 30% ends up in the crop. This is, these are numbers that are not unlike the numbers that you saw earlier. About 30, 35% um, total uptake of this nitrogen into the harvest and taken off of the field. On, on fields that are just receiving synthetic fertilizer, the typical ratio is about 50 to 60% uptake. Um, some of it goes into the atmosphere, and, um, and that part, even though it's small, it's very important from a climate change perspective. Um, we have relatively little runoff um, in the Central Valley and the Salinas Valley. They are flat. Uh, rivers are far away. It's a, it's a Mediterranean climate, and what little runs off typically percolates somewhere else into groundwater. So what's left, if you look at the long-term average, what's left in that balance, the one leak that everything else that's left over goes to is groundwater. And if you look at groundwater, you heard um, earlier, when you have dry periods, you tend to have lots of mineralization. Well, California is a dry place, and it's a very dry place this year. And so we don't have soils with 8% or 10% organic matter. Our soils typically have less than 1% organic matter. And even soils that receive a lot of manure, there's a lot of mineralization, they, do, they will not build up about much, above much than 1%, maybe 2% of organic matter. Um, and so there isn't a whole lot of, there is some nitrogen storage that happens, um, but in the long run, the nitrogen that goes into these fields eventually comes out, and, and most of it comes out and leaches into groundwater. The other piece that's really important to recognize, and this is a groundwater perspective, You've heard um, the previous speakers talk about um, the application rates and the uptake rates. How does that relate to groundwater and the drinking water limit of nitrate? Well, we recharge in these irrigated, on, on, in, in these irrigated regions, the average recharge is on the order of about one foot per year, one acre foot per acre per year. If that one acre foot is at the drinking water limit for nitrate, that's 27 pounds of nitrogen. So in other words, if I lose more than 27 pounds of nitrogen on average from this agricultural landscape, then that recharge is above the drinking water limit. In a really well-irrigated system, and on most dairies, we have flood irrigation on, on forage fields, and they, they over-irrigate by substantial amounts, and they lose about two acre foot per acre per year, um, they can afford to lose maybe 50 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year before that recharge gets to be over, <laughs> over, the, um, over, the, over the limit. So this blue part here that you see, this blue part that's leaching to groundwater, that's about five times as much as the drinking water limit, or four times as much as the drinking water limit by the time it gets to groundwater. And what's not denitrified in groundwater ultimately will show up in wells. And what we're predicting is that the amount of nitrate that we're currently seeing in wells is only the peak of, the, uh, the peak of an iceberg. We're going to see this number go up, whatever we do with groundwater, with, with, with the sources of nitrate for some time, for some time to come. Now, we have, we, we have done, um, and you've heard this morning about many management practices that can be done to deal with reducing nitrogen inputs to groundwater that all have to do with the timing of irrigations, with the, with the, with the amount of irrigation, and with the timing, quantification, and placement of the nutrients. Now in California, we actually have the luxury that we control the amount of water that goes on our fields, which many of you don't have here in Washington because you have so much precipitation. So let me, with this overview, let me go and focus much more specifically on the dairies. 
and tell you sort of the California stories on these dairies. And I, I apologize that I'm not as familiar with dairies here in Washington and the situation here in Washington, but take from this um, and, and, and you knowing your dairies, you, um, uh, you might have some insights from what I'm sharing about California. We have essentially three dairy regions in California. We have the Chino Basin, which is an, an, a historic dairy reservation that's now being urbanized and going away. It was a concentrated dairy facility. Uh, it was essentially the, uh, the ultimate, um, the ultimate CAFO with, with um, animal holding yards and no crops being grown. All of their manure set there and leached into groundwater. We have coastal basins, uh, coastal, uh, coastal dairies in Northern California, primarily north of San Francisco, and then in the Eureka area in Humboldt County, um, where we have small, mostly small uh, coastal dairies that are pasture-based. And then we have the Central Valley, and mostly the southern part of the southern and central part of the Central Valley, where we have most of the dairies now that are in California. This is an, a picture of Ferndale, Ferndale dairies up um, along the coast in Northern California. In red here, this is in the Central Valley. In red here, you can see how these dairies are scattered about this very intensively farmed landscape of many, many different crops of which dairies are just one part. This is an aerial photo. Um, and this is really important to understanding how we can approach regulating or, or looking at dairies. Dairies are part of a diverse agricultural portfolio in California and they, um, they, you, you, you see a typical dairy in, in the Central Valley is a freestall dairy. Um, you have the freestalls. Um, manure gets collected um, through flush lanes. Um, solids are being separated and the liquids are being stored in uh, lagoons and each of these dairies that you see on here uh, somewhere would have a lagoon. I have some difficulties with getting the um, cursor here going. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Okay, here's, so here's, a lagoon, here's an example of a lagoon um, and you'll find another lagoon here and if you look through this picture you'll find plenty of lagoons where, a lot of the li where all of the liquid manure is being stored. Um, and then all of these dairies in the Central Valley are surrounded by acreage um, uh, used for growing forage fields and used for essentially applying these, uh, these manures. Here's a bit, uh, a bit more of a, um, a, a categorization of what dairies as a source of nitrate actually look like. So I mentioned, I mentioned, the, um, I mentioned the lagoons, which I'm Look, uh, showing here in blue. So all the blue, the blue places are lagoons. Then we have, and I'm losing my cursor. Then we have in red, we have housing. In brown, we have um, animal yards. And in green, we have forage fields. The dark green ones all receive either solid manure or liquid manure. And there's a few fields in this particular picture, the light green ones that only receive synthetic fertilizer. Traditionally, the management on our days has been until the mid-2000s to apply synthetic fertilizer on summer corn and winter grain and use the fallow period in the spring and in the fall to essentially dump the content of the lagoon on the field as a waste discharge, as essentially a waste discharge. Um, and there was very little, there was some thinking of that manure being a soil amendment, but there was not much in terms of doing actual nutrient management with that. Um, and that's something that uh, much of our work changed. When, <clears throat> when we look closer, so we have from a, from a, from a groundwater perspective, um, I'm not only need to distinguish between these different sources on a field, but even within an individual source, there's a lot of variability. This is on the right-hand side, you see a picture of a corral. Um, in these corrals, we may have areas where w w surface water is in the winter will accumulate and percolate, uh, force percolation into groundwater. On fields, we have a lot of non-uniformity. Um, we use flood irrigation. Um, we have typically fairly light soils. We have much more infiltration at the top of the field than at the bottom of the field. And as a result, the amount of nitrate leaching um, differs substantially between the top end of a field and the bottom end of a field. 
not only are we dealing with nitrate, we're also dealing with salts. Uh, salt in groundwater is a significant issue because all groundwater is used for irrigation as well. And increasing salinity levels in groundwater make it, make it more and more difficult to use that groundwater for irrigation. Pesticides are an issue, and then we have a whole slew of emerging contaminants that we um, have looked at and continue to look at, pathogens uh, being one of them, and with new rules from the Food and Drug Administration coming to the forefront. Antibiotics and other pharmaceuticals are an issue on dairy, dairies, and we've also done work with steroid hormones. Um, let me show you some results first from the Ferndale region, which is probably the largest coastal dairy region that we have in California, um, entirely pasture-based system with cows on pasture, typically about nine to 11 months out of the year. Uh, it's about 10,000 acres of pasture land, about 100 farms with an average of 100 milking cows um, on that land. And what we see in groundwater, we did an extensive domestic well survey in that region. Um, most domestic wells are only about 30 to 50 feet deep, shallow groundwater. But we only found out of over 120, we had three wells that actually exceeded the nitrate uh, limit. Um, you can see those dark red spots here. There's areas in the west, on the west side of this basin where nitrate is naturally denitrified because of clay soils and reducing conditions. Um, and on the east side of this, on the right-hand side of this region, um, we do see levels that are typically about half the drinking water limit, and that's a result of the manure of the manure going or the manure nitrogen going into groundwater, with some dilution from from the groundwater that flows flows through there, and the levels of nitrate that are there can largely be explained by uh, the net loss of nitrogen out of that system. In the Central Valley, we have about 1,500 dairies with one and a half million uh, milking cows. Um, and you can see the distribution here. They're, they're fairly widely distributed across the valley. We have about 12, in the, in the last 15 years, we have built monitoring systems and worked with about 12 dairies. Um, and I'm distinguishing, distinguishing, distinguishing between dairies in the Northern San Joaquin Valley where the soils tend to be sandy and groundwater levels are 10 feet below ground surface. Um, a highly vulnerable groundwater system where it's very easy to contaminate the groundwater. And on the other hand, the Tulare Lake Basin, dairies there often sit on groundwater that's over 100 feet below ground surface. Their soils tend to be um, not quite as sandy. Um, and there is at least an opportunity to better manage uh, that nitrogen. When we monitor, when we do groundwater monitoring on dairies, we try to address the fact that the dairy is not a single source. It's actually multiple sources. It's the animal yards, it's the lagoons, and it's the fields uh, where manure is being applied. And so we construct monitoring wells in intentionally, so they're immediately down gradient to the degree we can tell where down gradient is, which is often difficult to say without having already drilled a whole bunch of wells. So to the degree we can guess where down gradient is, we try to put our monitoring wells down gradient from corrals, down gradient from lagoons, and down gradient from manure treated fields. What do we find? This is the distribution of nitrate on five different dairies in this northern region that's highly vulnerable. We have average nitrate concentrations um, under those dairies that are between four and six times the drinking water limit. Um, there's, there is a huge uh, variation of nitrate levels within each dairy. Uh, these are histograms showing the, uh, the range of concentrations and the frequency with which they occur. And you can see each of these dairies, each of these five dairies had, has a really wide range of nitrogen concentrations. But when we compare dairies, they're not all that different. They all have nitrogen levels that exceed uh, the drinking water limit by that factor four to six that I mentioned, and they all have a wide range. So <clears throat> there, is, there is a significant consistency across these dairies. In, in the southern part of the valley, in Tulare Lake Basin, um, we consistently find less nitrate in groundwater. Um, on the left side, in each of these five diagrams, each of which designates a different unit. So we have 
Um, we have here, the, um, in the upper left, you have the corral data, the average corral data. In the upper right, you have the average field data. In the lower left, the average data below uh, lagoons. And then an upgrading or background uh, graph on the lower right-hand side. The two points are for, on the left, the northern San Joaquin Valley with the shallow water table and the sandy soils, very vulnerable. And on the right, for the Tulare Lake Basin, where it's 100 feet to groundwater and the soils are typically somewhat heavier. So we do, the fact that there is that much extra depth to groundwater and the fact that the soils aren't quite so sandy does, make, does seem to make a significant difference in the nitrate concentration. What drives this nitrate concentration, though, in both basins is primarily the mass balance on the field side, meaning the leaky pipe that we heard about earlier. So we have in the lower graph here, well, let me explain. The upper right-hand graph shows the layout of two large fields that we've managed, on which we've managed manure over a six-year period, with the black dots being the monitoring wells that are either upgrading or downgrading from these fields and groundwater flowing essentially from the right side towards the left side of that particular graph in the upper right hand corner. I cannot activate my mouse, I apologize. Um, what you see on the lower, in the lower graph is two bars, um, one for the winter, two, two bars for each winter and summer. Let me see what I can get my mouse here, yes. So, each of, these two bar, each of these two bars is one season, the winter season and then the summer season. And on the left-hand side, you see the nitrogen that goes into the field. And the right-hand side, you see the nitrogen that comes off in form of harvest. And I'm splitting the nitrogen on the left-hand side into um, the light gray being ammonium nitrogen and the dark gray being organic nitrogen. And organic nitrogen is that part that is really fuzzy. We don't really know when that becomes available. What you can see on this graph is there is a significant imbalance between the amount of nitrogen that goes in and the amount of nitrogen that comes out. We started managing this um, system at about halfway through. So in 1998, we started managing the system and we put a lot less nitrogen into the system, trying to actually match the plant uptake with the manure applications rather than applying synthetic fertilizer and completely eliminating surplus applications of manure just to empty out the lagoon. <clears throat> if you look at the difference between um, what goes in and what goes out, we're again looking at this, um, at this allowed limit of 54 pounds that I mentioned earlier. If I have two acre feet per acre of recharge, I can essentially afford about 50 pounds of nitrogen losses per acre per year without having that recharge be above the drinking water limit. If I look at the balance, um, in red is the uptake, in blue is the leftover. And the leftover is on the order of, before we started treating the system, on the order of five to 700 pounds which theoretically would give me a groundwater concentration of over 100 milligrams of nitrogen per liter, over 10 times the drinking water limit. And after managing this, we should actually get to a fairly uh, significantly uh, reduction in uh, nitrate. Um, and we modeled this, and in fact, the, measure, the, the model data are, the model groundwater nitrogen concentration are the red line based on these inputs that I'm showing in the upper left-hand side. And the measured nitrate concentrations are those blue dots. Um, and <coughs> uh, showing that, in fact, by these, these measurements in these groundwater monitoring wells show that, in fact, changing the mass balance and changing or closing some of those leaks in, the, in that pipe does, in fact, impact groundwater quality in a predictable manner. And if we compare the dairies in the Tulare Lake Basin and in the northern San Joaquin Valley, the Tulare Lake Basin, in fact, managed their nitrogen much better than a lot of the dairies in the northern San Joaquin Valley. They can, they, they can in fact, manage their nitrogen better because their soils aren't quite so light. Uh, they have a higher water holding capacity. They can uh, manage higher levels of nitrogen in their soil. But more importantly, they rotate their corn winter grain fields frequently with alfalfa. 
and, um, and essentially give the land some rest. And so if you look at the long-term balance on these uh, Tulare Lake Basin dairies, they tend to be a much better balance from a nitrogen management perspective than the Northern San Joaquin Valley dairies, which in fact is the key driver behind that difference in nitrate levels and not the depth to groundwater. Phosphorus was mentioned earlier. That's another issue that we also deal with. We have fairly high levels of phosphorus in shallow groundwater that's underneath sandy soils. We see phosphorus levels that we would never want to see in a stream on the order of one to 10 milligrams per liter and even higher than that. But because there are no streams that this water goes to, phosphorus in the Central Valley of California tends to not be an issue. I mentioned salinity um, in areas where groundwater is very, low in salinity, dairies in fact have a major impact on that salinity. Whereas in dairies where salinity is already high because of natural conditions, what comes in from the dairies will not really change much in terms of the salinity levels. Um, I wanted to, wanted to also quickly show some results on the pathogen levels and some of these other um, uh, pieces that were, uh, some of these other emerging contaminants. We frequently find pathogens in manure. We find it in the wastewater. We find it in the corrals. Um, that, and we specifically looked at Salmonella. We looked at Campylobacter. And we looked at E. coli O157. In addition to looking at what's called indicator bacteria, such as generic E. coli and Enterococcus. All of those we find at the surface of of all the dairies that we have looked at. And we, we have looked at two dairies intensively, and we've looked at 12 dairies. Um, uh, through groundwater monitoring. When we look at groundwater in these alluvial systems with their sandy to loamy, loamy sandy soils, with, um, with the aquifer being in often sandy to loamy sandy um, sediment materials, none of the pathogenic bacteria typically show up, even at the shallow monitoring wells from which we're monitoring at about 10 to 30 feet depth. We do find generic E. coli and we do find Enterococcus. We do find these indicator, patho these indicator bacteria uh, showing that there is some transport and, and some chance that some of these pathogens may occur. We looked at domestic wells across eight dairies. Um, we had, in domestic wells, we had no occurrence of pathogenic bacteria. We had frequent occurrence of Enterococcus indicator bacteria. Um, and limited occurrence of generic E. coli. So I don't think pathogens are a big groundwater issues. It's not to say that there's no concern about this. There should be concern in areas with very sandy soils and very shallow domestic wells. Antibiotics, uh, dairies use antibiotics just like any other animal farming facility. Um, a lot of the antibiotics use is for preventive um, uh, care. Um, rather than for acute care. And one of the largest um, antibiotics used is monensin. We've, we looked at monensin, we looked at, at other antibiotics in these dairies. We find antibiotics throughout the surface of the dairy in wastewater and in corrals. And we do find some of these antibiotics in shallow groundwater, primarily next, typically next to a lagoon that's leaking. Um, we find much less and at much, much lower frequency, uh, we find these antibiotics in fields. Um, and often we don't see any antibiotics at all, even on sandier fields with very shallow groundwater. Antibiotic resistance is an issue. This is something that the antibiotics cause in the uh, bacteria. Um, and that antibiotic resistance, there's concern about that being carried forward into drinking water and then affecting the antibiotic resistance that we experience when we're uh, um, treating ourselves with antibiotics for whatever disease we're, we have. So this is sort of a wild, wild tour around the science problem of, of dairy groundwater quality. Let me look, sort of take more of a, a legal and regulatory perspective um, next. Um, we have this Babylonic Tower of overlying regulations with the federal government setting the standards and then states having the freedom to, to um, tighten the rules and then local agencies can tighten over the state rules. Um, fundamentally, when we look at dairies and groundwater quality, 
um, and uh, specifically nitrate in drinking water, there are two federal frameworks that, well, there's two frameworks that apply. One is the waste discharge um, into, into water body, um, and the other one is the regulations around, around drinking water. Um, let me look at the, uh, the regulations related to waste discharge. We have, in fact, a long history of regulating waste, waste discharge in the United States. Most of that comes from the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act in the early 1970s said, if you're discharging into surface water, if you're discharging waste into surface water, you have to get a permit, so-called NPDES permit. Um, and regulatory agencies around the country, um, state agencies have been set up to deal with this. Uh, with respect to groundwater, the Clean Water Act does nothing because the Clean Water Act doesn't know groundwater. The Clean Water Act does not say anything about waste discharges to groundwater and will not regulate any waste discharges to groundwater. We have other federal laws that deal with um, uh, specifically toxic wastes under, to under the Toxic Substances Control Act, with landfills and impoundments under the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, and with existing groundwater contamination at industrial sites, the so-called Superfund uh, program. None of that regulates fertilizer. We do have, a, we do have FIFRA, which regulates the use of pesticides. Um, under these groundwater regulations, we've, <laughs> regulatory agencies have developed sort of a, uh, over the last 40 years, they've developed programs about how to go about making sure we detect contamination in groundwater from toxic substances, how to characterize that contamination once it occurs, and how to clean it up um, to, um, to remediate the groundwater. And it typically goes like this. You have, for example, a gas station with an underground storage tank. In order to figure out whether or not that underground storage tank is leaking, there's a leak control on the storage tank. There's design standards for the storage tank. But there's also monitoring wells, downgrading and upgrading from a gas station. And if there's contamination, lots of monitoring wells are being drilled to characterize it. And even more wells are being drilled to try to remediate this problem. This is showing in the lower right-hand side a typical plume from a, uh, uh, actually in this case, from a dry cleaner site. We have dealt with agriculture very little in this context. Where we started dealing with agriculture is under implementing the total maximum daily load rules in the Clean Water Act. Um, looking at watersheds, looking at total impacts to watersheds, taking a single measurement at the outlet of a watershed and determining whether or not this watershed may be, may be impacted or not. For groundwater, we do not have this. But in California, we have a version of the Clean Water Act that actually includes groundwater as a recognized water body where if you discharge waste, you actually have to get a permit. Except for, while the law has been on the book since 1969, we haven't, had, we haven't looked at agriculture until 2002. Um, we had, there were regulatory changes that happened, were legal changes that happened in California in the early 2000s, which forced the regulatory agencies to actually give out permits to agricultural operations because they um, are discharging waste into groundwater. So here you have a set of regulatory agencies that have dealt with gas stations and dry cleaners and industrial uh, pollution, and they're now supposed to do regulation of agriculture. Well, their first thought is, well, let's do the same thing that we're doing on these, on these um, um, industrial operations, which is we'll install monitoring wells, we'll do characterization, and if there's a problem, we do remediation. And the first place that they looked at were the dairies. Uh, we had a dairy order in 2007, and we're currently implementing an, uh, 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 a second order that actually will affect all of irrigated agriculture in the Central Valley, about 7 million acres. And all the, re all, the entire state is undertaking a salt and nutrient basin plan amendment um, to essentially, over the next five years, control all salt and nitrogen sources that discharge into either surface water or groundwater. The problem with applying these old sets, these old paradigms, these old regulatory paradigms to, um, that were built around point sources, about, around plumes that are 500 or 1,000 feet long, to an agricultural landscape that encompasses 7 million acres, with about 10% of that being dairies, is that it doesn't work. Um, 
it, we can't use monitoring wells to characterize the amount of contamination um, or to, to, to determine whether there was a leak. Agriculture leaks all the time. And this is not about uh, preventing a leak. We know that we're leaking. Um, um, the frequency is, 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 uh, is on, an con con on an ongoing basis. And most importantly, we have one nitrate source next to another nitrate source next to another nitrate source. And so the monitoring tools that we have available in terms of groundwater monitoring become rather ineffective. And as you've seen from uh, the previous talk, soil monitoring is very expensive and it doesn't really deal with much of the, um, with much of the heterogeneity that we have in soils. So let me jump forward and say the framework that we currently have, that we've developed over the last 40 years for regulating, regulating groundwater, doesn't really fit well with the agricultural landscape that we're trying to regulate. And what we need is a new paradigm um, and one that instead of focusing on groundwater monitoring wells, takes a what I call three-tracked approach to monitoring. Take a proxy monitoring tool that is relevant to the farmer, including the dairy farmer, um, and that can be easily measured. And in California, we've taken the view that the nitrogen mass balance is a good tool to start with monitoring groundwater di nitrogen discharges to groundwater. Um, so enforcing rules around that nitrogen mass balance is going to be very critical um, in getting to controlling nitrate leaching. Having research, like the research that you saw earlier today, that links that nitrogen mass balance with the actual discharge that occurs into groundwater is going to be a second part of this. And having a regional monitoring network that doesn't necessarily hit every dairy, but that's representative of the landscape in general, will be a third part of this monitoring effort. So I want to close with saying, there's challenges ahead, and you've heard many of those before. From a science perspective, understanding how these non-point source pollutions work is critical. Understanding what management practices work and not work is why we're here today. From a regulatory perspective, having agencies that deal with point source pollution change their paradigms and adjust to non-point source pollution is a fundamental sociocultural shift and has to has has Impl implies that there is a learning curve on the regulatory side as much as there has to be a learning curve on the agricultural side, which is simply not used to being as regulated as they likely will be over the next 10 years, at least in California and perhaps in Washington. That discussion we'll have this afternoon. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Dr. Harder? We have, uh, we have time for maybe three questions. In your discussion on land app, uh, was the predominant irrigation system surface and sprinkler or mix or one over the other? That's a great question. So on the dairies uh, in the Central Valley, uh, the predominant cropping system is corn in the summer, grains in the winter, double cropping, sometimes triple cropping with Sudan crass in the fall. That for three years, and then on the, at least in the southern part of the valley, you have three years of alfalfa, all of which is flood irrigated. Flood irrigated or floor irrigated. There's no sprinklers on cornfields in California. Um, if you're on the coast, a lot of those pastures are sprinkler irrigated, either wheel line sprinklers or, or um, big, uh, big guns. Is, is the efficiency of irrigation application Fairly high. Low. On, the, on these four and flood irrigated uh, systems, the irrigation efficiency is less than 50%. During the study, was there improvements in your recommendation or your study showed improvements of nutrient management had a significant result in reduced? Right. And that came about primarily as a result of changing the nutrient application timing. Um, so getting rid of all of the waste applications in the first place and then replacing synthetic fertilizer largely with manure nitrogen. And what, what we have found is that we have relatively high mineralization rates. 
um, at least in the short term, short term, we were able to actually manage a, uh, a high yielding corn crop with the manure. Um, there were questions and we, um, we, did not, we ha did not have the funding to continue the experiments for another uh, two to th four years to look at whether there was in fact some soil mineralization that benefited initially having still high yields. Um, but to really improve that system further, we would have to change the irrigation system, and right now the industry isn't ready to do that. During the course of the study, did the level of irrigation water management stay relatively constant? That stayed relatively constant, yes. You talked about the work to uh, lower the overall application rates of manure in those areas that you were studying to avoid the you know, excess application of nitrogen. Uh, from a management standpoint, um, where is that additional manure going? Is it being spread out on larger areas of fields or are there other, uh, other solutions? I think you're pointing your finger to the biggest problem and that's really this problem. Um, we have, in the Central Valley, we have 7 million acres of irrigated crops and we're producing as much nitrogen in manure. Well, we are, actually, let me put it this way. We land apply. This is after all of the losses, atmospheric losses, um, between the back end of the cow and the land application. We land apply as much nitrogen as we're harvesting in all of the crops. And so what it re the, the fundamental issue that we're facing in the Central Valley is if we really want to dial down how much we're leaking out of the right-hand side, the blue part of the pie, if we, if we want to ratch that down by about 60 or 70 percent, then the only place on the left-hand side that we have to ratch down is the yellow part because the, the brown part, the manure part, is a given unless we change the herd size. <laughs> the biosolids and effluent is a given unless we change the people, the number of people in the valley. And what comes out of our irrigation systems in nitrate that's already in groundwater, we're not going to change that without treatment. And the atmospheric deposition is going to continue to happen. So those are fixed nitrogen sources in our fields. And the only one we can really dial down is the synthetic fertilizer. And ultimately, the only way we can manage our crops with manure in the way we're currently managing them with synthetic fertilizer is we if we find ways to make a manure fertilizer product that, and I like to say, that looks, smells, feels, and operates just like synthetic fertilizer. And some of the challenges there have to do with the organic part in that manure, which is just, it's just not made for precision fertilization. One final question. Outstanding uh, presentation, thank you. Uh, you you mentioned uh, the Federal Clean Water Act, so it, it was enacted in 1972. And one of the reasons was Cuyahoga River caught fire. So that was the emphasis of uh, uh, point source. So the E of NPDES uh, is uh, for elimination. So all the point sources should have been eliminated by uh, 1985. And here, yeah. So, so basically it's not as effective as should have been for uh, either point source nor non-point source. And there was a recent article with, uh, you know, in Government Accountability Office. So do you think, based on your expertise, that the time has come revisiting the Federal Clean Water Act? I think we should discuss that this afternoon. That's a, yeah, that's a policy yeah. interesting question. Yeah, it's a good question. All right, I think it is time to switch to our next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Harder. Thank you.